Welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Ambassador Bhadra Kumar and we are going to look at the outcome of G20. Ambassador Bhadra Kumar, you know G20 is supposed to be looking at world issues, a place where all heads of state are coming together to look at the crisis of, shall we say, international affairs, economy, ecology, all of this. Nothing seems to have happened in G20 this time. They have met, they have hardly taken any stand on any of these issues and uh, they seem to be, whatever has happened seems to have happened only on the sidelines. Yes, uh, Prabir, you know, the, uh, uh, keep in mind how the genesis of the G20, that's very important. And then you can, you can make out from where it started and where it has ended. You know, ended in the sense where it is today. today. And we'll be able to understand this slightly better. Huh? Uh, you're absolutely right, what you said. I agree with your statement. Uh, you know, in the 1990s, 1997, 98, 99, uh, you had this uh, great financial crisis, uh, starting with Mexico, and then uh, Russia, and then the Asian financial crisis, and finally it ended up in America, you know, that. So that time, uh, it shook up. The, uh, you know, first time really, you know, the Bretton Woods system, it sh really shook up, you know. And uh, the... This is where the East Asian Tigers also came yes, in crisis. Yes. In Korea, yeah, South yeah, Korea, yeah, and yeah, Taiwan, yeah. and so on. And then, you know, the whole startling thing that uh, uh, without any other help from the Bretton Woods uh, uh, institutions and so on, the Asian countries manage their crisis. Now, you see, this is the unkindest cut of all, you know, that uh, uh, there was really no Western help needed. And uh, China appeared for the first time on the scene in a construct in a big way, you know. It's also interesting what Malaysia did. It rejected yeah. all the advice of yeah. the financial institutions yeah. and got out of the crisis mm. as easily yes. or as dif so difficulty as Asians others did. managed. Asians managed on their own steam, you know, this is the thing. So uh, this was there, with, this was not mentioned, you know, this was, uh, but this was seriously noted in the West. This is for the first time this is happening. Uh, the uh, idea came to uh, have a small grouping uh, which will uh, uh, stabilize the international financial system. This is the genesis in 1999, if I remember correctly. And so, uh, what was its composition? It, was, uh, it, it comprised of uh, central bank governors. So you can imagine the thrust was very, very focused on this, that you know, that this sort of situations when they arise, how these instruments which have, which have uh, created after the F World War II, uh, the International Monetary Fund, World Bank, etc., could play a role, and you know, the policies in that direction, financial matter. Then came in 2008, 2007, 2008, this breakdown in America, you know, for the first time. I mean, it, 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 it assumed a different overtone altogether because we know very well it was a crisis of capitalism, you know, really. So uh, that came up. And again, the thing is, what emerged out of this was again in uh, political terms or in terms of the ebb and flow of history, is this that uh, the Ameri without the American economy being the locomotive for the world economy, the world can chug along. The Chinese helped, you know, the world to cope with the situation while the Americans were in serious uh, ailment, you know, they're sick and uh, they were uh, unable to we play in a role in the world system. So this is what you are saying, the motor of the global economy yeah. started becoming China. Yeah, China, That, that China. is really the so issue So this uh, shift uh, alongside a growing realization that the group called the G7, G8, which became again G7 after Russia's eviction from it, that uh, was uh, no longer that important as it was thought to be. The 2008 crisis made it very clear that uh, the era of the G7 being the navigator, you know, that has ended because there are forces outside the G7's uh, parameters which are having a lot of clout and they are also gathering steam. 
and in the coming decades they are going to be and therefore you cannot ignore them any longer and because if you do that G7 will become totally irrelevant you know all the activities really the locus would shift outside the G7 so the this is Barack Obama's idea also this basically you see this is all very a desperate attempt to perpetuate the so-called liberal international order you know or what a, we call the neoliberal uh, neoliberal order. you know so Washington consensus these are all components of it you know so to uh, perpetuate this this G20 was created and uh, very arbitrarily in a hurry they even uh, worked on the composition G20 means 19 sovereign countries states which are supposed to be emerging powers uh, plus the established powers which are really can be uh, you know taken as the uh, really the front runners uh, the flag carriers of in the world economy uh, plus European Union but you know <coughs> you see the composition from uh, uh, Asia there is certainly China there India there Japan, Indonesia, Australia. <laughs> you see, now emerging powers, if you look at it, I mean, in, within ASEAN, only Indonesia is there, you know. And uh, I don't think the future of Asia lies in the hands of Australia at all. Australia is struggling with its own identity. So similarly, from West Asia, they took Saudi Arabia. The next G20 is going to be in Saudi Arabia. And the Saudi Arabia is a far smaller it has a population economy yeah, that follows yeah. to Syria. It's, it's, it's an economy which is pivoted on uh, just one commodity, <laughs> which is oil. You know, but that is playing a role there because that is playing a role also because oil trade, petrodollar, all that, all you know, taken into account. So you're saying the era, this was really created to... Very, very quickly for this purpose, actually to bring on board the powers like the BRICS powers, you know, the emerging powers to... Uh, bring them onto the table without so much as acknowledging that uh, the flag is gone out of our hands and you guys are going to be the flag carriers tomorrow. So they have also been brought into the Western club. That is G20, you know, this is there. Now, <coughs> then it, there is a metamorphosis taking place. What began as uh, a forum for addressing the international financial system uh, evolved into a process concerning global governance, you know. For which United Nations was supposed to be the platform. So, supposed to be the platform. In fact, at one point in the discourses, someone even argued, why have this G20 platform? Why not have an economic security council within the United Nations, like a UN security council to address issues of war and peace and international security. So similarly, why not have an economic security council to deal with this so that it comes under the UN umbrella? That was the thing. But you know, you know, here what we have to uh, bear in mind that this was all a very desperate attempt seeing the writing on the wall. Globalization was introduced with a certain agenda for the capitalist world. But then the paradox is that China adapted itself so brilliantly well to <laughs> globalization that, you know, playing by the rules of it, you know. They can't contain China. They can't contain China. So, you know, the thing is that, the, the, so therefore this is all in terms of what they are seeing happening that countries like uh, uh, China, India, they are uh, going so fast they are going to be tomorrow major powers and uh, they have to be brought on to the table. This is actually the consideration. And anyway, anyway it shifted to global uh, governance I mentioned. So then it came, which is I think which is very sensible because uh, you cannot uh, deal with this international financial system and so on in isolation. Very other factors come in. Wealth creation, you come to trade. And yeah, but let's look at what's mm -hmm. happening now. Mm -hmm. As it stands, ah, now what is really not playing. Now what has happened? Doesn't seem to be playing. Yeah, what has happened is, you know, Prabir, if you look back at the Cold War era, um, despite all the 
tensions and you know all the kind of things which went on there uh, there was a certain predictability about that yes, era you know, i i'm just going to I stop you on that yeah. because i think we should come back uh, mm. maybe another time on these issues but let's look at the immediate context because yeah, we really yeah. talk so about the failure of the G20 yeah, yeah. in I my view. I tell you view. why it failed no, I'm, is... I'm, I'm going to ask you yeah, specifically yeah, yeah, yeah. that do you think the G20 is failing also because the rule-based system to whatever extent it was mm, existing mm. has now been given up under the unilateralism of Trump, President Trump, who does not believe in any rules except the one he wants to set. No, I have a f uh, feeling that, you know, that uh, it will be unfair to put the blame on uh, Trump here because basically the root of it is the failure of capitalism and which I think Marxist thinkers over the last couple of centuries have said this. Many, many a time they have said this and that is uh, happening in front of our eyes that, you know, that inexorably capitalism will lead to wars, to inequality and to dictatorships. All of these are happening. All of these are happening. All of these are happening. Yeah. So but the in breakdown. This, in this, if you see <coughs> President Obama's time, mm -hmm. there was a recognition that there are limits beyond which maybe the United States may be able to go surreptitiously, but not frontally. Now, Trump is basically also saying we can do it frontally. The trade war with China, for instance, for example, pulling out of the Iran uh, agreement, the J JCPOA. All of this seems to say, I will set my own rules and you have to abide by it because I still am the global hegemon. You see, the, uh, the rise of these industrial powers historically uh, has not been on the basis of free trade. Of course, not. free trade is something which they have propagated after they became enormously wealthy so that, you know, that they can continue to transfer wealth from you and me to them. You know, but this is what as it you was. To remember, yeah. uh, the, you, the United Kingdom, Britain mm. at the mm. time, proposed free trade to export opium to China, <laughs> while they would not accept opium coming into <laughs> exactly. England. Exactly, yes. yes. So that was free trade, yeah. Yeah. which is really free loot, mm -hmm. shall we say. So you see, the, uh, today you are right in saying this, that, uh, that uh, this global governance platform, which G20 evolved into, it cannot come to terms with the real issues today because the real issues are issues of this kind, the breakdown of the multilateral processes, not only trade, whole multilateral processes. America has turned its back on multilateral processes. Absolutely. Now, Iran question, if you take, for example, uh, overall uh, crisis in capitalism, then this uh, 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 aberrations which have come in in the Trump era, uh, which are, I think, really speaking, which are, you know, which have taken a very pronounced form, but it is not r correct to say that this is a, um, uh, Trump's doing, you know, if... Uh, we are just symbolizing him because yes, he's his president. Yes. Let's face it, uh, Bolton, so, Bolton and Trump pulling out of not, sure, not only this, all the uh, agreements on, for instance, restraint on nuclear uh, shall we say, even now they talk of even nuclear bomb explosions, mm -hmm. that NP, the non-proliferation non is a different issue. Mm -hmm. But they had also said we will not explode any more bombs. Mm -hmm. Now they're saying no, we can even test bombs. Mm -hmm. So even the comprehensive test ban treaty is now they talk of mm -hmm. abandoning mm -hmm. it. Forget what, how many treaties they pulled out of, mm -hmm. SALT, uh, START, and uh, what was it? about the intermediate uh, missiles, mm -hmm. INF treaty. So all of this would seem to show, and it's, you're right, it's not Trump alone. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier also Bush had also pulled out of it. But there is this Bolton uh, equivalent lobbies mm -hmm. uh, operating over there, mm -hmm. Bolton mm -hmm. being the most visible part, who are pulling out of all international treaties, of course, including the Iran one, mm -hmm. which we mm -hmm. have talked about. You know, the um, uh, climate change, if you take, Paris for example, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, an example, uh, on climate change, the G20 in Osaka just couldn't take a stance because the Americans Opposed. told the Japanese that it's out. Yeah. So now, you know, so this is the problem today. Uh, the, you used a, an expression, and uh, I'm sure it is intentionally, it's, it's really the matter that the rule-based order has broken down. And we are actually uh, heading towards anarchy. Now, you know, like uh, in, the, in the world order, 
in the international system everywhere anarchy now uh, wto is being dismantled again trump has refused to put even the judges yes. which are required for the yes. tariff disputes yes. if we don't have a dispute resettlement process in yes. wto it has no meaning exactly so you see uh, when uh, you don't have a rule based order and uh, uh, whatever G20 may say by way of uh, a statement, for example, a joint communique, will remain platitude which are not enforceable. Now, the irony of it is the leadership is going to get into the hands of Saudi Arabia. What a country <laughs> <laughs> to, 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 to lead the processes on global governance. Now this, uh, <laughs> which is a kingdom, is, uh, it's not a country. It's only a kingdom. <laughs> Saudi Arabia has never been declared. So you a see, country. this itself illustrates, <laughs> you know, the grotesqueness that has come in today, and uh, therefore, you know, what has happened is that uh, in the last two days, 28th and 29th in Osaka, this get together facilitated certain other types of interactions on the sidelines, uh, amongst and between the member states which are part of the G20. And I think therefore, uh, which I think is also serving a purpose in terms of uh, uh, regional and global stability and uh, all that. The two major ones, mm -hmm. one is that Trump has said that he will start talks with China. China and the uh, US have agreed to start talks without preconditions of the trade war, as we call it, mm -hmm. but we have also called it the tech war. We'll mm -hmm. have to see what happens. And also, I think that's even more important, Trump impromptu saying that he will go to the demilitarized zone and may meet with Kim, mm -hmm. which is symbolic enough, uh, whether mm -hmm. again what will happen is a different issue, but mm -hmm. symbolically, it at least shows that there is not going to be, say, mm -hmm. a nuclear war with uh, North Korea, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think these are at least small uh, I think several things steps. took place. You know, for example, the uh, if you look at from the Indian point of view, um, I think the drift in the uh, relations with the US that has been punctuated, I think so, in this meeting between Modi and uh, Trump. Where it leads to is a different matter, but that is one thing we have seen from the Indian side already. The uh, crisis building up in the US-Turkish relations, number of things took place, that's what I'm saying. Yeah? A lot of bilateral and trilateral. Trilateral, and most importantly, uh, in terms of international security, I think a certain thaw is visible in Russian-American relations. Now, uh, it's very bad situation. In fact, only last week, you know, uh, there were threatening uh, statements, you know, from all sides. NATO saying, giving an ultimatum on INF that by August, Russia should roll back its uh, new missile program, SS something, you know, the intermediate range thing, which the uh, Europeans say intermediate range thing. Uh, and the Russians, of course, will refuse. So that is coming to a pass. And then the Russian defense uh, deputy foreign minister, Ryabko, saying that uh, a repetition in a, in, a, in a testimony he gave to the parliament in Moscow, that uh, a repeat of uh, the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis cannot be ruled out, which means that if uh, the Americans put, uh, continue to put radars and radar systems and so on in Central Europe like this, something will appear in Cuba and Venezuela also. You see, so the situation is very bad. Eh? So from that point of view, um, this meeting which has to taken place, which neither side is uh, interested in calling a summit because it immediately raises, you know, hackles uh, in America. So uh, they've had a productive meeting, I would imagine, for 80 minutes after all. They talked to each other and I saw the television part, you know, the, the, the camera part, and you know, it is body language is quite good. Uh, so this is, uh, these are substantial uh, gains, gains, in some sense, out of this, yes. because if say, these club two, of yeah, G20. If these two, so this, uh, particularly this triangle, Russia, China, uh, US, uh, if uh, tensions can ease within this triangle, I think uh, the world will be better off, you know, uh, definitely. The catch here is uh, this, that, you know, that um, Trump, uh, I wrote this morning a piece on this, <laughs> so it is fresh in my mind. You know, Trump has been described as zero-sum Trump. 
by <laughs> an essayist some time ago and the other day I was taking the papers and I saw this article. You know, it came in Vox magazine, you know, there's a Vox is uh, a magazine. Internet yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. so, you know, the, the thing is, the man is so self-centered, you know, and he is not used to making compromises. And for him, negotiation means destruction of the other interlocutor and, uh, you know, his ultimate conquest is what negotiation has to lead to. So whether all these things, therefore, you know, will lead to something, I really don't know. But uh, generally, I think uh, the atmosphere is cleared up. You know, the climate is looking a little better this weekend at least. Hopefully. Yeah? Yeah. Any gains for India in the G20 that you can think of? India Modi has uh, engaged yeah. everybody. They have had a trilateral with uh, Russia, China and India, which is quite interesting. I think uh, India is coming of age, uh, uh, definitely, Indian diplomacy. Uh, in the sense that, you know, that um, we are a big economy. And uh, G20 is very important for India because it's one of those places, you know, where uh, India's uh, voice can resonate, you know. Uh, in the in if you take uh, compare it with the other things so i really hope that a process like g20 is available for india to articulate positions now this uh, free flow of data you know for example india took a very uh, clear position in terms of our national development agenda similarly g uh, 5g you know uh, like this that also is there here people were talking about terrorism. I don't think terrorism is so much the business of uh, G20. And I think the Prime Minister, did he raise it? I don't know. Well, mm. they have been trying to talk of it, the summit on terrorism and ah, so on. Ah. But let's put this this way. This has mm. been much more India's preoccupation. Mm. And it's also indirectly its proper preoccupation with Pakistan, mm. rather than its preoccupation really with terrorism mm. per se. So I think that doesn't I think, have uh, much the, uh, the uh, other thing where, you know, Trump has agreed that, you know, that the negotiate trade talks must continue and so on, where it leads to, I really don't know. We have to wait and see. We saw Pompeo Jayashankar's talks didn't really lead to anything. And we had predicted really that anything. before really the really meeting itself. Anything, yes. But the good thing is this, that, you know, that uh, we uh, now feel it that... Uh, an equal relationship with the United States is not possible, you know, uh, in the sense that uh, even its closest ally, look at it, you know, like Britain, it is treating it like a doormat. <laughs> and, you know, uh, India will be worse off, you know. Well, the, Britain has been called, United Kingdom has been called America's pet poodle, mm. United States pet poodle for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So, and if Boris Johnson becomes the prime minister, mm. a lot of people have compared him to mm -hmm. a shaggy dog. Mm -hmm. So it might gravitate from the mm -hmm. poodle into a shaggy dog. But that's the U Premier, UK, US One thing uh, uh, we have to keep in mind is this, that you know, that um, in the Russian-American uh, cemetery, uh, there is always the likelihood of uh, understanding being reached, you know, which we will get to know only later. What has uh, happened on Iran? Is an open question. It's an open question. No, I had a thought. feeling that something has has happened, because at least you know, going by the tweets of uh, Trump has become silent, you know, and when uh, Trump go becomes suddenly silent like this on uh, Iran like this, that means you know that uh, something else. There is another track uh, on which something is going. Happening. Something is happening. And the Russians also have not divulged anything. Though we know that uh, in the run-up to the G20, there was this uh, strange meeting of the three national security advisors in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. And after it's that... UK, uh, I mean US, yes. uh, Israel and yes. Russia. And after that, uh, senior Russian diplomats mentioned that uh, the input from there, the focus there was on Iran, the input from there will... Uh, be a uh, part of these part discussions. of the delivery uh, the, the discussions between the two presidents but nothing came out of that you know okay. after that that means that there is something possibly something working yeah. we'll come back and discuss iran next week yeah, sometime sure, sure. but i think the st if we take stock that i think we have taken a uh, does stock taking of G20 mm -hmm. and it raises, as you have said, very important questions. What does G20 do? What its mm -hmm. objective should be? Mm -hmm. And to what extent that is being performed today? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bhattrikumar, for being with us. We do hope to have you with us.
next week and we'll have a longer discussion in Iran. Maybe some of the things will become clearer then. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Do keep watching News Click.